Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. Verse 27, And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Verse 32. We're going to read through 34, Paul. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Let's pray. Father, we have rights as believers and children of God. We understand we are not the firstborn. But because of our being born into the kingdom, we have rights. And Father, I pray today that we will see that to become an extraordinary people, we cannot despise our birthrights. That to be an extraordinary people, you'll prick our hearts to excel and to see something and to do something that upon, uh, unto this time we've only dreamed of. I pray, Lord God, that you'll minister to every heart and every life here. Provoke us. Cause us to grow. Let us come unto good works and love in you. Let us see your word in a new and a different way. Let us see something here, Lord God, that plants within us a desire to leave ordinary and become extraordinary and understand that there are two manner of people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated. The scriptures teach that there are different types and kinds of people. That's not a revelation. But I want us to understand that the scriptures teach this. Jesus likened people to four different kinds. He says there was different kinds of soil. As the sower goes forth to sow the, so so the seed, it's going to fall on different kinds of people. He says that four kinds of people are going to come to hear his word. Four kinds of people come to church every Sunday. Four kinds of people come to church every Wednesday. Every time the word is sown, there are four kinds of people. When I was in Trinidad ministering the kingdom of God, there were four kinds of preachers that I was talking to. In our building today, in every church across the whole globe today, there are four kinds of people. But these four can be reduced to two. Two in the womb. Let me go ahead and show you where I'm going. Galatians chapter 4 verse 26 says that the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, is the mother of us all. You with me? Yep. And in her womb, in the church, are these four kinds of people. There's pathway people. There are people that have become hardened towards life because people have walked on them. 
And they've not learned how to handle that being mistreated or abused. And so they've been walked on and they're very hard people. A pathway. And what happens when you sow the sower, when the sower sows the seed? Immediately the fowls of the air come and remove the seed because they just want to be hard. They're mean people. They're aggravated people. They will not allow the plowing of the Holy Spirit to come upon their life and get into them something that will become productive for the kingdom. These people never produce anything for the kingdom because as soon as the word of the kingdom is shed upon them, the fowls come, the devil comes and removes the seed. Hard people, mean people. Non-productive to the kingdom. Produce no fruit. Second kind is the stony soil people. People that look good on the top. On the surface, on the outside, they seem and appear to have it all together. They look good. Seem to have it all together. But when a storm of life comes and begins to wash away the soil, all of a sudden these stones start popping up. Begin to see these, these rocks and these hard things in their lives that can come from false doctrines or, or ways that they were raised, uh, raised uh, different kinds of things that come start surfacing in their lives as the rains of life come upon them. They don't want to change. They don't want the Holy Spirit to remove those stones. They just want to be hard in certain areas. They're not hard in every area. They're not necessarily mean. But they got things in their life they refuse to remove. Stony soil people. The word sprouts up for a little while, but as soon as the sun rises and a little pressure comes, a little rain comes, Third kind of people Jesus talked about was the people that were thorny soil people. Again, they look good on the top. As you plow the good soil or the, or the thorny, thorny soil, it looks the same. But when certain climates and certain situations come along, when certain uh, avenues and seasons come along, all of a sudden these seeds that were down deep all of a sudden start popping up and it scares the world and the deceitfulness of riches. And again, the word is sown into them and it begins to, to come forth, but, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches begins to choke it out. You've seen people like this. They come to church. They love the Lord. They praise the Lord. They're having a good time in church. And all of a sudden, something comes along. Something needs to be done. I need some money. All of a sudden, something becomes more important than the things of the kingdom of God, and it chokes out the kingdom. He says there's a fourth kind. There's an extraordinary kind. There's the ordinary. Then there's the extraordinary. It's the good soil. It's the soil that can produce 160 and 30 fold. It's, it's the good soil. It's the soil that is productive, that, that has... And, and understand that, that it hasn't always been good soil. It started with pathway soil. It started with hardness and, and not ability to forgive, but it learned to forgive. And so it was plowed by forgiveness. And, and it learned that it had stones in it, that the stones that had to be removed and things that had to be taken out of our lives so that it wouldn't interrupt the things of the kingdom of God in us. And, and it learned that there were thorns in us, that there were cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches that had to be pulled out by its roots to get out of us so that we could receive the word of God, the kingdom, and produce fruit. This is the extraordinary soil. So the kinds of people that Jesus talked about can be reduced to two kinds. Even though there are four kinds, it can come down to two kinds. The ordinary and the extraordinary. Two kinds of people in the womb. Ezekiel talks about four kinds of people. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 5 talks about the four faces of man. In Hebrew... Four faces of humanity. All of us have a primary face. A lion, an ox, an eagle, or a man. And again, there are ordinary lions and extraordinary lions. There are ordinary eagles and extraordinary eagles. There are ordinary ox and extraordinary ox. There are ordinary men and extraordinary men. Come on. The lion is the guy who'll bite your head off. He roars at everything. Goes around roaring all day long. He roars. He knows there's something to be devoured that day. There's something to be conquered that day. He's out to feast on that and to pray on that. And his mind is focused. There are ox. Ox, you know, lives in a bubble. They don't really 
not motivated a whole lot. They, you, have to, you have to provoke an ox. You have to take him out of the stall and get him hooked up and get him going and get him plowing. You've got to take the ox out of his little bubble world, bring him into reality. But once you get him going, he'll plow valleys for you. Great people, just not real motivated. They live in a little bubble world. Eagle people. Eagle kind of people. There are eagles that, you know, they, they, these are the people that have to have every eye dotted just, and you can't just dot the eye. You've got to have the di eye dotted right over the top of the eye. And you can't just cross the T. It has to be straight. Everything has to be lined up just perfectly. But they have an ability to, to look out, look at distance and a long ways away from a high place, it seems like, and see things that a lion or an ox or a man can't see. There are the man, the man is the guy who, 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 who just every day is a new idea. Uh, let's do this today, but after he goes to sleep, he wants to do that tomorrow. And, and every day becomes a day of a new idea. Something new is going to happen, and we're going to enjoy something different. And he's the life of the party. He's the guy that loves to be around people. And you never find him alone. He's always got somebody over to his house or going to see somebody or always with somebody. Never finishing anything, but coming up with everything. <laughs> but in these four, you can still reduce them down to two. Two manner of people. Ordinary lion, ox, eagle, man. Extraordinary lion, ox, eagle, and man. Two manner of people in her womb. One will serve the other. One will rule the other. The ordinary is ruled by the extraordinary. Hmm. Which do you want to be? Easy question. But which are we? Where is my life? My ordinary or extraordinary? So I'm talking to you today about two manner of people in her womb. Do you agree that people are different? What makes us ordinary? What makes us extraordinary? What was the difference between Esau and Jacob? Do you understand, you know, uh, let me ask you a question. If you know the story of Jacob and Esau, you know that Jacob got the birthright. We just read it, right? He, 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 made, he made Esau promise and, and, and as it was sign a contract to give him the birthright. Did God ever rebuke Jacob for getting that birthright? The, though it wasn't Jacob's birthright, Jacob was going to get his portion, his blessing, but did God ever rebuke Jacob for taking the birthright? No! <laughs> and God will never rebuke you or I for wanting more than we've got. Esau despised it. Esau didn't care about it. But Jacob did. And the attitude of the people that God will take and cause to, to, to grow and go on in the kingdom of God are the people that want to acquire, desire to acquire. You with that? The difference between Jacob and Esau is that Jacob desired to acquire. And Esau was Kesara Sarah, Akum Matara. Don't worry, just go hunting. But Jacob stayed at home and schemed and planned and figured out ways to get more than he had. Now, let me, let me work on this a little while. And first of all, let's, let's get together on the difference. Uh, <clears throat> look at, at Genesis chapter 25 and verse 31. And let's read this passage one more time. Because the difference of ordinary and extraordinary, at least one of the differences, or if not the primary difference, is the extraordinary person desires to acquire. The extraordinary person despises it or, or is even indifferent about it. Looking at this in Genesis 25, 31, And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. 
Now, was the birthright, was it Jacob's? No. But did he want it? Yeah. So, I want to come, what do you want from the kingdom? Are you happy with where you are? See, the whole purpose of this message today is to provoke us a little bit, to cause us to kind of try to reach and see something that we've never reached for or, or, or seen before, to provoke us to a place to, to do something, to create something, to, to be something that we've never before been, only dreamed of, only sat around and thought about. Sell me this day thy birthright. Verse 34, then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage and lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. How many of you have realized that we have been given rights because we've been born into the kingdom? Right. Have we? Now, we're not the firstborn. Who is the firstborn? Jesus. Jesus is. You're not going to get his portion. I'll just go ahead and tell you that. But I tell you what, I can get some of your portions because you, don't, you despise it. You could get someone else's portion because, you know what? They despise it. They're indifferent about it. Do you know why rich people are rich? They want to be. They want to be rich because somebody else didn't. And so the money was available, so what they do? Sell me this day. That birthright. Looking at that uh, verse 34 from the NIV version, which is a little, a little clear, it's not quite as severe. Then Jacob gave Esau bread, peas, and stew. So he ate and drank and went on about his business indifferent to the loss of the rights he had thrown away. Indifferent. Do you know why a lot of Christians go through a lot of garbage and a lot of junk and spend most of their time trying to beat the devil or beat their flesh or because they're indifferent to the gifts that they have as being born into the kingdom of God. Just indifferent. Don't care. Que sera, sera. Akuna matata. Just don't bother me, devil, and I won't bother you. Oh, that's, how many believe that's going to happen? <laughs> Whether you're a believer or a non-believer, the devil seeks about seeking whom he may devour. You don't have to be a believer. Just breathe. Let me, let me show you about the birthright first. Understand that the birthright uh, is, was what went to the firstborn. I'll explain it to you. Say a family had four sons. <clears throat> the inheritance would be divided into five. Every son would get one portion except the older, and he'd get a double portion. <laughs> and my daughter says, shoot. <laughs> This is the birthright now. now I mean, what, was, what was expected of him? He's born into power, but he's, but he's got to take care of daddy and mama when they're old. <laughs> it's his responsibility to continue the family name. It's his, he, he, he receives the power, the Bible says. He receives the authority of the father to continue on. And that's what, that was, that's what he was supposed to do. Now, showing you this from the vines... Vine's Expository Dictionary, just reading this as a quote, <clears throat> the oldest, our firstborn son, had special privileges within the family. He received the special family blessing, which meant spiritual and social leadership, and a double portion of the father's possessions, or twice what all the other sons received. He could lose this blessing through misdeeds or by selling it. That's from a Vines Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words. See, Jacob desired to acquire. Esau, Kesara, Zerah, Akuna Matata. Just let me go hunting. Where are we? Do you desire to acquire? Are you status quo? Yeah, we all want. Do we all want more? But you know what? We want to be like Esau. Give me pottage. Give me what I want. Rather than coming up with a plan to get it. Not just a plan to talk about getting it, but a plan that you implement at the first opportunity that you have when you find Esau hungry. You say, here's your pottage. Give me my birthright. We 
live in a society, especially in America, where it's give me pottage. Am I right? That's the ordinary. The extraordinary comes up with a plan and then implements that plan at the very first possibility of it being successful. 